All right. Hello, everyone. I'm trying something a little bit different with my microphone and headset right now, and basically just having it down here. If something sounds wrong with the audio, if it sounds a little quiet, if it sounds a little muffled or underwatery, uh, hop in the chat and let me know. And, you know, hopefully if there is a problem, I can fix it throughout the stream. Let's, you know, hope that there's not a problem. I don't see why there should be. All right. So welcome, welcome again uh, to the chat with the archaeologist. I'm your host, Chester, and I'm the project archaeologist for the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. Most of you tuning in probably already know me at this point. Um, per usual, we're going to begin with we're going to begin the stream with some announcements. Uh, then we'll do archaeology in the news, and then we'll get to our monthly lecture. The lecture topic this month is going to be my own research at Mesa Prieta and uh, what I've been doing. Uh, this is really the first research that I've been able to kind of see through to um, a state that I can actually share it uh, more broadly with the public and with a scientific audience since completing my PhD. So for any of you who are in grad school or in undergrad right now, yeah, there, there's life after the degree. Uh, we get to do cool things. Um, so I'll show, you, I'll show you some of the cool things that I've been working on. Next month, uh, we're going to have another guest archaeologist on the stream to chat. This is going to be fellow banana slug Elliot Helmer, who's going to be talking about indigenous uh, ontologies and indigenous uh, relationships with the land. Elliot uh, is finishing up their PhD at Washington State University, and uh, I think I might have already mentioned fellow banana slug. So tune in next month uh, for May to see Elliot talk, listen to Elliot talk, and that's going to be a really great one. I, I think you'll all get a lot out of it. I'm just going to try to straighten my camera here. All right, other announcements. Spring is warming up. Um, we've been getting consistent calls about tours. I still don't have anything firm to say. Um, obviously, in a normal year, we would be operating already. Uh, we would normally start tours in about March and continue them through around November or so. We haven't been able to start in March. We are hoping to start soon, and I can start to, again, we don't have anything firm, but I can share that we are hoping that by early summer, we'll have something going on fairly consistently. There's still a lot of moving parts, a lot of things to consider, but we think that the situation will be better in early summer and for everyone's safety for a number of reasons. Just holding off that little bit more, we think we can deliver better quality tours, safer tours for yourselves and our docents. And yeah, so stay tuned. Again, we'll make announcements on the stream, on our website, in our newsletter, and uh, on our social media. So yeah, keep a lookout. If you aren't subscribed to our newsletter, Go to our website. There's information for how to subscribe there. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. Make sure to uh, like the video, share it, share it around social media. Um, we're bringing on more guest speakers and trying to get more voices on the stream. So as you share, it uh, not only gives us more exposure, but helps out these uh, other archaeologists get their message out to a broader audience. So, again, you're, you're helping us, you're helping our guests, and, you know, you're helping everyone learn a little bit about archaeology. All right, more announcements. We've got a lot of interest in volunteers for this year, uh, a lot more than I was kind of expecting, at least. And, you know, I kind of scaled back my expectations at one point because, because of the pandemic last year, I didn't think that a lot of people would be interested then, and I thought that taking that year off was going to lead to a decline in interest this year. 
if anything, our list of people who are interested in beginning as volunteers for the first time with the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project is maybe a little bit longer right now than it was at, say, the start of March last year. Uh, and, and that's then add in everyone who's been waiting around for a year. So we're going to be getting going with that. Um, we need to figure out, you know, what kind of roles people will do. So far, what I can share is that as the project archaeologist, I will be running the recorder training, and we're getting the last of those materials in order to be able to share it with you. I may have mentioned that uh, last year we tried to go online with that and, and then just abandoned things altogether as the expected dip in the pandemic in the summer wasn't as much of a dip as just a plateau before another wave. So, you know, we really didn't get anyone new into the field. We really didn't change too many things. We had a lot of time to sit and think about the sorts of changes that we want to make and the sorts of changes that I want to make. So it's going to be a little bit better. Uh, we'll also had some practice preparing online training materials. And so that's going to refine your experience. So for any of you who are tuning in, who are hoping to join our petroglyph recording teams, who are citizen scientists, who are volunteers, um, and who are you know, contributing to the arts and the humanities as well, uh, wonderful. Glad you're interested. We're going to be glad to have you on board. We will be able to accommodate you this year, and I will be getting those materials out to you by the end of the week, hopefully before the end of the week next week. Like I said, most of that's in order already. We're just going through some uh, final review and strategizing about how we're going to do this. Um, because we want you to both get uh, training, and instead of a in-person, in-the-classroom training, we're going to do that online again. So we figure we can roll that out before all all the vaccinations and stuff have happened. Um, and then we're going to be looking at sometime around the time that, you know, maybe by happenstance or, or for some of the similar reasons to uh, when we're starting our tours, you know, maybe, you know, fingers crossed, early summer, um, maybe we can start working on getting some of you your uh, initial field experiences, giving you some guidance in person in the field and doing some checkouts of like, did you study? Did, did you do all of it? So more information, if you have signed up already, I have your emails, um, I have your email addresses and names, contact information, and I will be sending out information shortly. If you have not signed up, do so. Do so this weekend because I'm going to close the 2021 training very shortly. In fact, whenever it is next week that I can send out the revised training materials, that's when I'm closing training for the rest of the year. So. Um, yeah, if you are interested and haven't signed up, do so. Windows closing. And for the, the bunch of you who have signed up, great. Thank you for your enthusiasm, and uh, thank you for sort of bringing the program back. All right. So we're going to get started. We're going to dive into archaeology in the news and then into a little bit of what I've been doing. So, yeah, let's uh, dig in.
There we go. I'm back. All right. I uh, had a little bit of discrepancy where you couldn't really see me. Archaeology in the news. We're only going to cover three stories because these are all three fairly involved stories. And, uh, yeah, we'll start with new perspectives on very old coppersmithing in the new world. If that back and forth isn't confusing enough to you, then I haven't tried hard enough. That's an exciting story. Next, Ammon Bundy is back in the news. Now, what does... Uh, an Idaho rancher or the, the son of a Nevada rancher have to do with archaeology? We'll get into that. Uh, yeah, and then Bundy back in the news. And uh, finally, we'll wrap up the archaeology in the news with Hill Fort and Galician petroglyphs, followed by news from Mesa Prieta in archaeological research. All right, now I'm going to duck off the screen here. Ooh. So new perspectives on some very old copper, as we call it, in the new world. What do we mean by old copper? Well, some of you may know that copper smithing in the um, copper smithing in North America happened in the Great Lakes. So. We often hear this myth about New World archaeology in that everyone was in the quote-unquote Stone Age. And that's based on the fact that most tools were made out of stone at the time of contact. This, of course, erases quite a bit of metallurgy, uh, or quite a bit of the history of metallurgy in the Americas. Uh, we have at least two different metallurgy traditions that I'm personally aware of. We have one that originates in Mesoamerica, uh, possibly even Northern South America, depending on uh, how you line up carbon dates from related features. Some folks have argued, and you know, this is based on the knowledge that I had when I was doing field school in Honduras back in 2008. So. 13-year-old knowledge, it may be expired by now, but uh, my understanding at the time was that uh, copper working began in possibly Nicaragua, Panama, or even Colombia, and uh, that, would, that would have been around the time of what we call the uh, Epiclassic or the Terminal Classic, so maybe about 800, 900, 1000 AD, and then the technology um, spread among different cultures, was shared among cultures, a process that we call diffusion, in the early post-classic and into the middle post-classic as it spread northward. Some of the evidence for that was that, you know, we presumed that we had some of our earliest copper working sites in the south, particularly one of the earliest ones in Mesoamerica is actually this place called El Cayote in central Honduras. Um, but we don't really know a lot about Nicaragua because of socio-political and economic factors that have really hampered research in the area. Okay, so we've got the Mesoamerican stuff, and they're making not necessarily tools, but uh, definitely some folks call them luxury items. They're trade goods. They're you know, ornamental. They're musical. Again, bells. And those make it up into the southwest actually fairly quickly as this spreads along. We have another copper working tradition that existed prior to that in the Great Lakes region. And as someone who originally hails from the Great Lakes region, it's pretty cool. And it's also something that people forget about. Now, we already knew that this was old. And so that's why we called it old copper. How old? Well, it would correspond with about what in the Western US we call the archaic. Um, in, in fact, the early to middle archaic. Uh, but it also, we believed, uh, corresponded with a very similar thing that happened in uh, 
the near, middle, and far east, so the you know the Eastern Mediterranean, Asia Minor, and South Asia, all had copper working traditions in the end of the Neolithic, a time that we call the Chalcolithic. If we compare our conventional wisdom in North America for the Great Lakes area, old copper lasted from about 6,000 years ago to about 3,000 years ago, or about 4,000 BC to about 1,000 BC. That lines up pretty well with the advent of copper working in the old world too, where we have it uh, beginning about 6,500 years ago, which is about 4,500 BC. Some of the places that you see that, say Egypt, definitely had especially tools for carving stone made out of copper. Uh, and then lasting to about 3,600 years ago or 1,600 BC in China. So that was the common belief, and there was this outstanding question of why do we have copper ages that more or less line up, you know, give or take a few centuries, which is a blink in archaeological time. Um, why, do, why would we have these traditions that more or less line up it, uh, among these two different continents that aren't in contact with each other? Well, it turns out that they probably don't line up. And so recent work, and when I say recent, I mean the first of these papers to come out was about six years ago now, in 2015. Great Lakes copper was pushed back by more than 3,500 years, with a strong copper tradition beginning about 9,500 years ago, or 7,500 BC. That would be the end of... Uh, Paleo-Indian, uh, the beginning of the early Archaic. Uh, that's really, really old. Um, now, the oldest reliable dates on artifacts made from copper from the Great Lakes have been pushed back an extra thousand years, although there are very few of them from that time, which puts this firmly in the Paleo-Indian period at 10,500 years ago. Wow, nobody's working with metal at that time, except for the folks who were living in the Great Lakes. Right. But the new timeline, we've got a, a few isolated finds from 10,500 years ago. Uh, we really start to see an uptick 9,500 years ago. That's when it seems to start being adopted around the region, and then peaks 7,000 years ago to 500 years ago, or about... 5,000 to 3,000 BC. That's still very old. Right, so the question is, why stop? Well, time, energy, and durability. Uh, it, it takes more time to process copper and turn it into a thing, and yet these sorts of coppers that are being found in the Great Lakes, the sorts of copper ores, are unusually pure. When we look at the copper ores that were found in say, the ancient Near East, they were actually working with ones that were already, um, they were working with ores that were already natural alloys. So they were a little bit stronger, a little bit firmer, right? Slightly bronzed rather than just pure copper versus the Great Lakes, because it's more pure copper, that's a very soft metal. Well, and then there, so durability drops, and then the time and energy investment can become costly. Now, they have the time and energy, but a drought may have hit the region at about 5,000 years ago and, and lasted a few years, possibly decades. When there's a protracted drought, such as one that lasts decades, there's a huge strain on resources, and, um, especially if processing ores beyond just cold hammering, then, you know, there's also a demand on wood. But, um, yeah, so there's possibly a drought. Uh, people have fewer resources to process the copper into tools. Uh, they have less time to turn it into tools. And because 
processing copper into, say, a projectile point takes more time than flaking a stone projectile point or one from bone or antler, which we also seem to find in the area, um, then you're going to make fewer copper tools and focus on the more expedient tools, especially if you're stressed and, and have to devote more of your effort to subsistence because the land has turned more marginal due to a protracted drought. We also can't rule out inequality because copper never went away, or as I have bold and italicized here, copper, copper stuck around. It stuck around as ornaments and things that people associate with luxury goods, more, you know, uh, visual ornaments, uh, embellishments to ornaments with other materials embedded in them. Um, and so we see it kind of shift out of this utilitarian sphere into the more uh, symbolic and religious, possibly religious sphere, certainly also the, the sphere of economics and social inequality that we're more familiar with seeing it in. And so, yeah, but it never went away. We have this copper tradition. And when I saw this story, I was like, oh, that's me. We need to share that because once again, it's something that people forget. All right, archaeology in the news. Why does it say January here? Well, back in January, I covered a story about this guy. Remember this guy? Yeah, that guy. Yeah, we broke him down. If you don't remember, go check out that episode. The long and short of it is he was a part of a group that stormed the Capitol and beyond beyond just peaceful protesting, but actually breaking into the Capitol building. And since then, a lot of people have been getting arrested for trespassing, often because they bragged about it on social media. Um, yeah, it turns out that Big Brother's watching social media, too. Um, and that's what happened to this guy. Well, it also happened... Recently, to Ammon Bundy, oh, excuse me, Ammon Bundy, son of Cliven Bundy. Did my camera go away there? All right, I'm back. Um, if you don't know who the Bundys are, well, Father Cliven has his own Wikipedia page. And, okay, cool, right? Generally, that's not a goal you should have as a rancher. Um, if you're a rancher, I'm not going to tell you what, what to do, but when a rancher has their own Wikipedia page, that's kind of a red flag because it's not about his ranching. Well, kind of is. Uh, Cliven has for decades been feuding with the federal government over the actually relatively small fees for uh, grazing on BLM land. And uh, yeah, this culminated in 2014 and 2016 in the, um, well, there was a, a standoff in Nevada with federal agents on BLM land. Supporters of uh, Cliven and the militia that he's a part of the leadership of, that's uh, colloquially called the Bundy Gang. And Bundy Gang is their, uh, an ultra right-wing anti-government militia. Uh, they had a stand-up with federal agents. Their supporters drove uh, ATVs and four-wheelers on Native American archaeological sites, um, damaging Native American burials, damaging uh, the ruins of Pueblos. And, yeah, uh, just like I can't stand for that. Uh, they have a history of repeatedly damaging cultural resources. Now, that's the part that made the news. Of course, it was the damage caused by his uh, unauthorized grazing as well, because he stopped paying his fees, so he got banned from grazing on federal land and continued to do so, leading to the protests in the mid-20-teens. They were also in the news in 2016, I think it was 2016, for occupying a, um, 
a federal building in Oregon. And uh, I, I don't know why we didn't see this as sort of a harbinger of things yet to come, but turns out it was. And uh, yeah, folks got arrested. One person, uh, one member of the Bundy gang uh, was shot and killed during the armed occupation of the federal building in Oregon. Uh, so yeah, um, and Ammon Bundy, the son, was involved in that one. Uh, he has since been released, has been living in Idaho. Well, it turns out back in January, he was a part of the mob, the mob that stormed the Capitol building, and he bragged about it on social media. So he's been arrested multiple times since January for this, most recently earlier this week, in, uh, arrested in Idaho, again, for his involvement in um, occupying the federal building in uh, Washington, D.C. These, yeah, um, I try not to get too political on, on this stream. Uh, sometimes it's hard to disentangle politics and ethics, but this comes up because, one, we've talked about these before. Uh, we, we talked about the uh, January 6th insurrection before and how supporters of it and participants in it have mobilized images of white supremacy, white nationalism, and cultural appropriation to further their agenda. And Cliven and Ammon Bundy are a part of that demographic. They are the leadership of a private militia that has damaged cultural resources repeatedly over the course of years, if not decades. And yeah, it, uh, they're in with that same group. So that's why I'm covering it. All right. Um, I'll pop my face off here to make room for our next slide. On a more upbeat note, but also tying together a bunch of these themes, we've got a uh, Twitter saga presented by um, Manuel Gago. Uh, if anyone follows, or Manuel Gago, I might be saying that wrong. If anyone follows archeology span as a topic on Twitter, you may have noticed that there is a uh, theme on Wednesdays called Hill Forts Wednesday. On Wednesdays, folks use the hashtag Hill Forts Wednesday to post pictures of Hill Forts. It's cool stuff, and this one caught my eye because, well, we've got petroglyphs there. Let's kind of, first, this is what caught my eye. Uh, you'll see the dotted boxes. That's where the hill fort is. We'll get into hill forts in a moment. And then we've got these wonderful petroglyphs here that are these concentric circles. They're in steep relief. Um, we are in a very humid coastal climate, uh, or these are in a very humid coastal climate. I am not right now. Um, I'm not going to get my hands too close to the camera because you, you, you'll see just how dry my skin is right now. Uh, but these, yeah, this is a very humid coastal climate in uh, Galicia, which is in the northwest corner of Spain. Uh, the region shares a border with Portugal. And so the, the rocks don't get the same kind of patinas that we get here, but you can see that Whatever repatination there is, it's total. Um, this is one of the things we look for. Uh, but these, yeah, these relief concentric circles create these nice dark uh, shadows that are very easy to uh, very easy to make out. All right, so now we've got the the hill fort in the background, and you see that in a box. Hill forts are something that folks in Europe built in the uh, end of the Bronze Age. Okay, so we we just went from Copper Age to Bronze Age, and then this particular site, at least the hill fort in the box, is from the Iron Age. The petroglyphs might either be from the the Bronze Age or Copper Age. I was having trouble uh, finding an academic resource with firm dates on those petroglyphs. So that's what really caught my eye, and. Uh, there actually tends to be a lot more story behind this post 
behind this hill fort because Manuel is actually someone who uh, does research, research or has recently done research in this region and shared a bit of the history of his project and their relationship with the local community and, and how their relationship with the locals evolved based on history and sort of coming to terms with that history. Um, so Spain in the middle of the 20th century was one of the Axis powers. In fact, uh, Franco is really the only major, dic major Axis dictator who never fell at the end of World War II. Um, so while you know Italy's dictatorship fell, while you know Nazi Germany's dictatorship fell, uh, Spain did not, and Spain remained fascist until dictator Francisco Franco passed away in 1975. At which point, uh, Spain reverted to a monarchy, in practice, essentially a constitutional monarchy. So. This story, you know, obviously the middle 20th century is long after the <laughs> long after the Iron Age, but the town's history is deeply entwined in both. I, you know, I forgot to mention we were back here on the hill forts, um, especially late Bronze Age and. Uh, early Iron Age Europe is associated with Celts and Gauls. And so even though Galicia is not in the strictest sense um, Gaelic or Gaul, they are considered to be related. And the name shares an etymology from Greco-Roman accounts during um, the classical period. All right, so anyhow, that's Galicia and the Iron Age. But we have to consider Galicia in the middle 20th century, in the age of fascism. It turns out that uh, Franco and Franco's supporters had these quote-unquote work camps uh, everywhere else. We called them uh, concentration camps, uh, except in the United States. Uh, I think we called them internment camps, but it was certainly a worldwide phenomenon that continued in both um, Spain and the U.S. after the uh, liberation of Central Europe, um, and, and even decades longer in Spain. So these uh, work camps were um, often sort of pitched under the guise of other projects, one of them being a purported archaeological project at this particular hill fort, hill fort rather, where uh, Manuel uh, was working. And so this kind of also ties in with, we just talked about white nationalists in our own country in the present day. And one of the reasons why this, uh, why I decided to share this story and all of it is because this also ties into themes of extreme nationalism. Now, I do want to disentangle that from the concept of patriotism because, um, well, patriotism can have its downfalls and can seem similar to nationalism. I am not critiquing patriotism. Um, rather, the use or misuse of archaeology for nationalism being you know, very, uh, well, looking within the own country, uh, your own country and um, ignoring additional narratives that do not fit into a particular construction of that identity can lead to a sort of separation between the actual events of the past and the way that they're represented in, um, in archaeology. This was a huge problem in Central Europe, too, in the middle of the 20th century, as archaeologists contributed to the sorts of narratives that led to the rise of fascism and 
the um, uh, eventual genocide of millions of people. Um, and so we're, we're trying to come to terms with that, and yet we still keep confronting it when we see groups like the Bundy Gang damaging cultural resources, when we see um, – uh, if I uh, can recall the guy's name, you know, the uh, the self-purported Q shaman, uh, Jacob and uh, Jacob and Jelly, um, his name was spelled a few different ways in the media. Um, when these people take on the when they engage in cultural appropriation, take on the images of indigenous people, and damage the archaeological remains they are actually participating in the same sorts of destructive social systems that archaeologists themselves are <laughs> culpable <laughs> for perpetuating throughout the 20th century. And in fact, we still see some of these attitudes percolating up in archaeology again. Um, so, yeah, anyway, anyway, this helps us address that. Um, and so in order to be able to work at this hill fort scene from an aerial view in the box there, Manuel had to engage with the community. And one way he found was that fertility rates were really low. So um, that cued him into engaging with children. Fertility is something that I'll touch on very briefly coming up. So, yeah, um, a part of his project and a part of building positive relationships with this uh, Galician community was to reach out and uh, create educational programming for children um, and, and to get them engaged in the process of archaeology. This is, we'll touch on that in a moment. In, in this process, he also gets some of the oral history that, um, you know, remembers the theft of artifacts important to the town um, from the from the hill fort and these were found during you know found in the 50s again there were the uh, Franco work camps going on and then Franco dies um, there's a I can't recall off the top of my head which which King um, took over immediately after Franco and it was during that upheaval in the early 80s that the, the statue was stolen. So Manuel engaged with uh, the children in the community and with the elders. And so we can see here a reconstruction of the stolen uh, boar's head. Um, they enlisted a stonemason. They, again, they got kids involved. And this is a part of a broader trend that we call democratizing archaeology. Essentially, that means not undermining the work of academics and scholars and professionals and PhDs, but making archaeology accessible to uh, the communities who have a stake in it, to the, to the people who live there, to the people who are descended from there, whether they are still residential or, or they've um, moved out into a sort of diaspora. Um, it, bringing it to all levels of engagement, from the youth to the general public and to elders. And so they were able to get elders who had not visited the hill fort uh, to sort of engage with the story. But going door to door, um, yeah, and, and that informs their knowledge of this place and its past, because even if the hill forts from the Iron Age, it has remained a part of the community and a part of its identity ever since and remains that way today. And here's just this. This is the cherry on top. Archaeology is not only about the past. It's about the present, the daily life of local people and how they deal with their own identity and memory. When an archaeological site is open to research, you also open many other doors. And 
yes, archaeology is not only about the past. It's about the present. And that brings us to what we're doing in the present at Mesa Prieta. Shout out to our friends over at Aspen CRM. Uh, this is the latest news is that they have uh, come out to the Mesa and we are uh, cooperating in a partnership together to engage in research and advancing archaeological methods using, uh, at least in part, aerial reconnaissance. What do I mean by aerial reconnaissance? Drones or UAVs, if you like, TLAs, three-letter acronyms. And, oh, yeah, okay, good. My face went away again. Um, <laughs> just checking that my face wasn't, uh, wasn't there. And uh, so we're partnering together on research, on a broader research project, one of the outgrowths of which is my SAA paper. So for those of you who are um, members of the Society for American Archaeology, tune in April 17th is uh, I think when we do our uh, live Q&A, and I believe that these talks are available um, throughout, um, but, but we'll do the live Q&A on the 17th, so a week from tomorrow. My title, Selective Hearing Towards a Puebloan Probability Model for Archaeoacoustic Landscape Properties Using Iconography and Geophysical Variables. Okay, I'll try to tone down the jargon here. Uh, since uh, you all are not archaeologists, uh, well, some of you are, some of you are not. Uh, I'm trying to bring this to a more general audience and, and not just, you know, puff my chest in front of, uh, in front of others here. So... First off, the disclaimer, um, I've noticed uh, several YouTube channels that I follow are starting to include similar disclaimers to this, and I think it's fitting to include this in archaeological studies too, especially since as practitioners of the social sciences, we were sort of at the forefront of these sorts of things, um, uh, of, of recognizing uh, indigenous peoples, their ties to the land and the names that they have for it. So here's our disclaimer. And then on the, uh, on the other side of the screen, we've got kind of a map of some areas that we've recorded so far. I've uh, stripped away a lot of location information, so you won't be able to uh, identify specific petroglyph panels from this one. Um, but this kind of shows you, for the first time, we're able to visualize the distribution and density of petroglyphs. At a, this is a small sample of Mesa Prieta, a small sample being there's several hundred acres shown here. And uh, it, there we go. So I'm working with this data. And before I get into the methods of what do I do, how, how do I utilize maps like that and information like that? Uh, there's a couple of important theories to understand, and I'm going to try to bring these down to the plainest possible English. Basically, that means giving you a vocabulary list. Yes, this will be on the final, uh, so take notes. <laughs> um, no, but it's not on the final. Uh, persistent places. These are places that people return to again and again, even if there is a, uh, a change in demographics, say due to migration, uh, displacement, or uh, simply culture change over uh, dramatic periods of time, long periods of time, people still return to these places. Persistent places are persistent in that they are persistently significant to whoever is living there. You can think of the uh, the temples in uh, Central, yeah, in, in Central America, where there's a, a a temple platform. The temple on top was knocked off um, during the Spanish conquest, and a church built on top. That is an example of a persistent place. It has remained religiously significant despite migration significant changes in ideology and political leadership, yet that place has remained persistent, right? Mesa Prieta is a persistent place. 
Persistent places are made, and they are always in the process of becoming, and so we must think of them in terms of placemaking. So a persistent place becomes a place that is persistent because it is made to do so by being a part of social life. And we used to think of placemaking as something that happened. Now we better understand it as something that is happening or had been happening. It is usually is still happening as I turn back to Galicia for just a moment. We recognize that even after the hill fort fell into disuse sometime in the, um, in the Iron Age, the history of that place is so entangled with the local community that the process of placemaking is still ongoing. The significance of that place is still changing, right? Um, and so we also tend to think of landscapes as being involved in their own process of being made, in their own process of becoming. How can it do that? Well, many indigenous peoples, many non-Western peoples think of land as having agency. What is agency? Agency is just the capacity to act. We avoid using terms like free will, but agency is the capacity to act, especially in a social situation. Landscapes were conceived of as having agency and that they had the capacity to act, sometimes just as the land and sometimes embodied as a place spirit or chenii uh, loci, um, spirits of places. And so that means that if they can act or they could be seen to act, then the, the social life of that landscape, or that landscape is involved in its own process of being made in a social setting. Including perspectives like this, like this indigenous perspective of landscapes being involved in their own process of becoming, is what we call multivocality. Multivocality is simply including multiple voices. This is something we try to do here at Mesa Prieta, and this is something that is becoming broadly more popular in archaeology, especially archaeology informed by uh, philosophies of science since about 1970. Multivocality also means, uh, like in the Galician study, he talked with the local community. He engaged with elders and with children and got their own perspectives and shared his knowledge with theirs. This is in response to some critiques that happened in, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, where there was a debate over whether objectivity exists or not. And I think the debate's still going on, but I've certainly taken sides. The idea is, is that we, you know, one camp says that we're all objective or even if we are not individually objective, we um, all observe things on the same objective plane of observation, but that's not actually the case. That um, because we come in with so many of our own motives and our own perspectives and philosophies, our own religions, political ideologies, that what we observe, even if it's on the same plane, is going to be fundamentally different because it's in uh, our mode of observing and thus what we observe from that is affected by our own preconceptions. And so when we engage in multivocality, we create a plurality of perspectives, which uh, leads to this intersubjectivity. Think of it as approaching objectivity. The more perspectives we get, the more that the consensus is likely to represent some shared reality, and that's democratizing archaeology. That is what we do here at Mesa Prieta, and it was great to see this description of the democratization of archaeology in a study of, uh, the book is called Ontologies of Rock Art. If you don't know what ontologies are, that's fine, uh, but this is a great quote from Abadia and Poor. This book just came out. Quote, an increase of community-based cultural maintenance initiatives, which have had a number of theoretical, practical, and methodological consequences for archaeological and rock art research. That sounds like us. 
right? We are community-based cultural maintenance, and a community-based cultural maintenance initiative. We are making theoretical impacts and methodological impacts, you know, such as our collaboration with uh, Aspen CRM and our ongoing partnership with them. And this is rock art research. So it was great. It was great to see that. Um, so here's a bit of what I did is if you refer back to that map a few slides ago, uh, that's based on a petroglyph database that uh, at the time had about 6,000 petroglyph panels in it. It's got more now. It had about 6,000 a few months ago when uh, I was looking into it, uh, when, when I was you know, finishing up this study a few months ago. Uh, kind of have been working on, I was actually starting this last year around this time. So I was looking for cues in what we call the geomorphology, so the geography of the landscape, uh, the, the shape of it, what it contains, as well as the iconography, iconography being the actual images. Uh, and then I did, uh, I did terrestrial, so from the ground 3D models, and our friends from Aspen CRM did aerial. I'll be showing some of the terrestrial ones momentarily, so the ones that I made. And um, systematic acoustic experiments integrating the acoustics with the 3D and 3D models and 360 view sheds, so completely spherical view sheds, to create VR environments in which I could conduct anthropological and scientific analysis. Pretty cool, huh? Um, so here are some of the types of landscapes that I looked at very briefly. We've got hollows, hollows. It's a geography term. We've got lithophones or ringing rocks. Here's one. It's hard to tell. Um, I've got more to say about this, but not the time to say it in. And then whisper galleries. So, uh, so lithophones are stones that when you hit them with something, they make noise or hit them in a particular way. Um, the, the, either the crystalline structure or the metallic minerals in the rock allow the sound waves to pass through the rock and its shape and size allow those sound waves to resonate and it makes a tone and then we get whisper galleries and these are uh, basically areas that sound bounces back off of oh and speaking stones so whisper galleries uh, there's there's some great examples there's a space flight museum um, south of Albuquerque uh, here in New Mexico that has a, uh, a concrete whisper gallery with large concrete dishes on either end and you can you can whisper conversations despite being like 50 feet apart. Um, we have some of those naturally occurring at Mesa Prieta and this is the first time I've been able to share having identified them. We also have speaking stones which are essentially one end of a whisper gallery uh, and, and these have sort of curved surfaces. To share a little bit about um, what I'm doing uh, with each of these types of landscapes, I've prepared a couple of animations and we're going to start with speaking stones. Yeah. There we go. All right, so this is what we call a speaking stone. If we zoom in here very quickly, um, we'll start off with the petroglyph panel because uh, this is how recording starts. Our recording volunteers um, will go out into the field and they will make a drawing of this. They'll photograph it, they will measure it, they will write down those measurements and its GPS coordinates onto a sheet that includes the drawing and uh, a, descript a written description that is classified by New Mexico standards, uh, which were developed in part using data from Mesa Prieta, as well as the Galisteo Basin, uh, south of Santa Fe and the Albuquerque area. Um, so our recorders will go in and draw this. Here we have concentric circles. At the center is a vesicular inclusion in this basalt. So vesicular is just it's 
porous. It, it's got a spongy texture. We're going to go over on time. Stay tuned. Keep, keep watching. We're going to go over an hour, but um, uh, yeah, my computer is not going to run out of battery or anything. Uh, <laughs> so just stick with me here. Um, so we've got this uh, vesicular inclusion, and, and they used that as a part of creating this design of concentric circles. And then at some point, someone retouched this design to include a, a head on top, transforming it from concentric circles into a quote unquote shield bearer. So we've got another panel on this stone too. And that's going to be yet another set of concentric circles. At first glance, it kind of looks like a shield bearer. That's just an optical illusion. It's just concentric circles. All right, and we can see how it's on a curved surface. So when we rotate this model, there's going to be kind of an awkward rotation here, but you'll be able to see both of these panels are on curved surfaces. So when you stand in front of them and speak at them, you hear your voice coming back at you. It's very distinct. And uh, yeah, it's um, very noticeable. So speaking of speaking stones, this is one of our more prominent panels. Uh, many of you who have done our tours will recognize this one. This is a uh, heraldic Spanish lion. This one's a little bit atypical because it's rendered more in a Pueblo style than in a Pueblo style. And then over here, we've got a uh, shield bearer. I'm just going to rewind that just a little bit here. All right, so we've got, we've got our heraldic lion. You can tell it's a lion. It's got the mane. It's got the toes. Um, so even though it's atypical in that it has a, a Pueblo-style rectangular body, a straight tail, it's still inspired by Spanish heraldry. And then we can come over here. And this is where we have a shield bearer. Um, this is a very prominent shield bearer and a very large one. And he is holding what you would call a kui, uh, which is a stone axe, um, either axes or clubs. Um, an axe is, is a better word for it. And there's another one depicted um, just off to his side. And what's interesting is this lion is a speaking stone. Um, I've been out to this several times in the last few weeks, uh, last month or two. And yeah, that's, that's yeah, actually several times over the last year. Um, you'll probably uh, actually recognize that lion if you've looked at any of our virtual tours. And you'll also recognize, so you'll recognize the lion. And you'll also recognize the shield bearer. Because right now we have web-based virtual tours. Um, for our lion and uh, for our heraldic lions and for our shield bearers. And both of these are featured on those. So if you want to see the 3D models with them and interact with them, check out these tours. You can interact with both of them. Here, I've got them together because they're right next to each other on the landscape. And so you can see how uh, if someone were to be speaking at the lion, or if you were to roar like a lion at the lion, then the shield bearer actually shields anyone in front of it, facing it from the sound of the lion. So that's pretty cool. And that's the sort of interactions that we can see using 3D models that there's no, really no other technique that captures that pretty well. So our 3D models are various ways of representing them. Um, this is what we call a point cloud. And let's, let's, let's pause, let's rewind a little bit. So what we just showed was a textured mesh. That's the final product. They all start as point clouds, um, but this has an immense detail, right? Because everything you're seeing is a point that has information about its, its location and its color in it. And we're making these 3D models um, uh, especially um, myself and our, our friends at Aspen CRM are making 3D models um, that are detailed enough that 
just from the points alone, you can see the petroglyphs. So this is another spot. If you've taken one of our tours, you'll probably recognize this spot. All right, so you can see petroglyphs there, right? So some of, the, um, some of this approach is millimeter accuracy. And we, yeah, we've got, we've got other stuff there. We've, got, we've even got a flute player right there. I don't, I don't know if you can uh, see him, but yep, there's a flute player right there. I need to, I need to learn where there's a Telestrator tool on my streaming software so I can circle things for you. Um, so these are incredibly detailed and give you a sense of space. So if we're looking at a sense of space, well, this is a large space. This is what I've been referring to as landscape scale photogrammetry because we can see the landscape that these things are in. Photogrammetry, by the way, is just making 3D models from photos. It's a way of doing it, um, gives you color. It's a way that I can do. Um, so again, we're just looking at the point cloud. We could make this model fuller. Um, and, and in time, in time I, I will fill out this model. So it looks like there's some empty spaces here. There's still points there. And so when we finish processing, we create what's called a mesh, which is just playing connect the dots with all the points. And then once you've got the mesh, it, 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 it's a mesh, right? That's why you call it a mesh, because it looks like a mesh. Uh, then between all of those lines from playing, uh, uh, from playing connect the dots, you've got, you've got a plane between you know, every set of three uh, lines, and that's, that's a face. So then we go back to photographic data and put the photos of that space onto that space and and that gives you the full model like you were seeing with the with the first couple of examples so that's where we'll go with this one but um, that takes a lot of time and a lot of processing power um, so this is just a, a kind of quick and a quick and dirty way of showing the uh, look at this space and when you move the camera around you can get a sense of the space these are whisper galleries here by the way notice how these spaces are concave. Let's start this one again. All right, so we've got this long space. And now you'll notice there's a, a niche in the rocks, right? You can even maybe see my tripod standing in front of the niche, right? And then we're going to zoom across the landscape. Facing that first niche, there's a rock shelter there, so a small cave. Um, and then there's our lithophone. And then just below the lithophone is another one of those niches. Those niches act a lot like our speaking stones in that um, they reflect sound very much in the same way. So this is a whisper gallery, like the one that you would see at the uh, Space Flight Museum. You can stand at either end of this and actually hold a conversation <laughs> without shouting. And this is some of the stuff that we're doing. This is just beginning to scratch the surface of how I'm using uh, virtual reality approaches to conducting, um, conducting well, scientific research, uh, research in the humanities, anthropological research. There's a lot, of, um, a, a lot of branches on this tree. And this all starts from the efforts that uh, we started doing in order to provide you virtual tours. We have a lot more of those in development. We've just got a couple of previews for you, uh, but do check them out. Go to our website under, uh, I think, uh, tor towards the top of the menu, there's uh, Visit the Preserve. And if you expand that, you'll see virtual tours. We've got them on there. We've got more coming soon. Check out the first two. We've got some examples of those first two in these animations I've just shared with you. And it, the sort of methods and um, yeah, the methods that we've done for that, the 3D models, the, um, the uh, spherical panoramas that we've been uh, collecting so that you can get this immersive sense of space. Also assist me with, uh, with my acoustical research and I'm studying the acoustics of these spaces and we're working on ways to bring that to you as well. Um, and so right now I'm running this on a computer-based environment and actually integrating where 
I have my tripods, my microphones set up, I can make a sound and it will reflect off of those things like, like those ends of the whisper gallery we saw in this model. And then because of the types of microphones that I'm using uh, and, and the, the way that I'm recording, I'm, you know, recording, uh, I've got two different ways of recording four tracks at a time. So I can record up to eight tracks at once uh, as a part of trying to characterize the acoustics, the echoes, so we can tell where it comes from. And, and also uh, some, some variables of it. And that brings us back to our slideshow. There we go. Nice transition. Um, so we've got, you know, I, I'm looking for some certain parameters for acoustics, and you don't have to remember these because these are uh, derived from acoustical engineering. But basically, I'm measuring for how loud the echoes, uh, how loud the initial echoes are, um, reverberation. You know, you all have some sense of what reverb is. But reverb is different in a lot of different spaces, so I use different measurements and compare those measurements to each other to get a more qualitative, uh, humanistic understanding of, is this strongly reverberating? What is your first impression of the reverb? What is, uh, how long does it last? How quickly does the reverb drop off? How long is it delayed? How does that contribute to your sense of the depth of space? So. How noticeable is it? How does it contribute to the sense of the depth of space? And how does it enhance or reduce the clarity of voice and of music? I'll also be looking at resonant tones, although that's a little bit outside of what I'm covering here. Um, and then we found that this stuff is actually associated with some agricultural features. So this is stuff that um, our uh, friends at Aspen CRM were able to share in their models and uh, got some ground photos. So some of these things that might be difficult to see on the ground that might get overlooked, we can see from this uh, aerial photogrammetry. And what we found is that some of these spaces with good echoes and good reverb also have agricultural features. People were growing probably the three sisters crops here, certainly corn. We can, we can definitely verify they were growing corn here. Um, but what does that mean for sound? And, and we, have to, we have to take the anthropological and humanities approach to add some context. Of what is the significance of flute players? So it's no surprise we found that places where we have flute player images are really, really, really likely to have good acoustics. Um, I, I ran the stats on that as a part of the scientific branch of this study, and yeah, it's very statistically significant. Um, but then we, you know, should we look for sprouting seeds if we're seeing acoustical spaces associated with agricultural features and that? We already found that not only, um, not only are echoing reverberating places associated with flute players, but strangely, they're also associated with um, what we call martial imagery, uh, shields, shield bearers, uh, people carrying shields, and people carrying implements of war, like kui. So that's pretty interesting to find, too. Um, yeah, and so if you want to learn more about my findings, if you want to hear about the stats, check out my uh, SAA presentation. I compress it into a very short amount of time. Um, but I would like to acknowledge um, everyone who has in, in, in some way contributed to both our virtual tours and to this and uh, some forthcoming papers that are also working from the, the same data sets. Uh, and so that's going to be our partners at Aspen CRM Solutions, helping us build some of those. Um, I, I didn't show you any of their 3D models, but they help us do that. And they can do aerial surveys. Thanks to them. Uh, as always, thanks to the Archaeological Conservancy. Um, they, uh, uh, thank you to them for uh, preserving the Wells Petroglyph Preserve and uh, supporting our uh, virtualization approaches and um, 
Yeah, just generally being supportive of letting me do research and us um, creating uh, opportunities for others to, to access the area and do research as well. Uh, also, shout out to the um, National Endowment for the Humanities and the New Mexico Humanities Council. I've before mentioned that they are responsible for uh, having gotten this stream uh, kicked off and going last year and, and supporting it through the end of season one. Uh, so we wouldn't have season two if it wasn't for season one and the support that they provided, but also we wouldn't have the virtual tours, um, including the, the, the sphere, immersive spherical settings uh, or the 3D models or um, even the time for me to go out and uh, do some of this acoustic stuff if it weren't for their support. Um, and, and so now I'm able to use that data for, um, for scholarly publications and for, for ongoing research. So shout out to them for supporting that. Uh, as always, I'll be putting these uh, references in the description. Uh, it's, it's a long reference list and it's only select ones, but um, check them out. Uh, there's ones on, uh, if you want to learn more about uh, some of the types of images that we found were significant, like parrots, shields, martial imagery. Um, yeah. And if you want to learn more about acoustics or archaeological theory, I've got some of the important references listed in there. Also, um, some of my uh, earlier work that uh, I've, I've also done some of these approaches in. So. Yeah, uh, thank you all for tuning in. We've gone over the time once again, uh, but that's, uh, that's the way it is. Um, uh, John Kinchelo says, um, notice that the lion's mouth is open. Yeah, well, thank you for pointing that out, John. Um, that's uh, something that we see on, on a couple of panels, uh, especially on the Wells Preserve. Uh, there's uh, at least one animal flute player uh, that shares a panel, uh, a whole scene that has uh, two human figures on either side. And all those human figures have, um, they have their mouths open too. Um, so thank you for, uh, for pointing that out, John. Um, open mouths are uh, certainly something we should be looking for if we're looking for uh, acoustical features. Um, and, and thank you for your feedback on the uh, virtual tours. Um, so, and y'all, y'all should take John's word. Well, don't take John's word for it. Go check them out. Um, go check them out for yourself. And if that's all the comments that we have, uh, as always, uh, feel free to drop in the comments. Oh yeah, and uh, fun to no fun uh, drops us a uh, lion. So, uh, roar right back at you. Um, yeah, uh, drop down in the comments. We do check the comments. Uh, we'll be doing another unanswered questions roundup uh, sometime in the, the next uh, maybe two or three months, uh, depending on guest speaker scheduling. So keep an eye out for that. And y'all have a wonderful weekend. Happy spring, everyone. That's, uh, that's it for me. I'm, I'm signing out. <laughs>